Welcome to show 145, Herb Lab. Today's show is brought to you by Ace High Heat Graphics. If you're looking to uh, get your logo or a message printed on a shirt for your group or organization or even your company, give them a shout out at acehighheatgraphics.com. And Candace Hunter at Get Healthy Now. Get healthy now with Candace. If you are interested in seeking out some natural remedies or some natural ways to take care of your family, Candace is accepting students. So give her a shout at gethealthynow.com. And Occupy Medical. Occupy Medical is a free street reach integrated health clinic in Eugene, Oregon. We are a 501c3 and we work very hard to prove that healthcare really is a human right. So you can contact us at occupy-medical.org. And Hunter Creation, if you're looking for uh, business cards, stickers, or brochures, websites, anything marketing related, they can help you out. And they give you a great price doing, in doing it. So contact them at huntercreation.com. And also Sue Sierra Lupe Consulting. Well, here at Sierra Lupe Herbal Consulting, you would be talking to me, Sue Sierra Lupe. I'm a certified cl clinical herbalist who started practice in 2006, and I offer in-home and distance consultations, custom formulations, and holistic care in conjunction with your existing diagnosis and medication. You can contact me at sue at thepracticalherbalist.org. Or, no, no, you can't. You can't, no, you can't do that. <laughs> Just kidding. You could contact me at sue at thepracticalherbalist.com. All right. <laughs> and finally, the Herbal Nerd Society. I'm still, I'm still recovering from that last one. <laughs> I'm sure the Herbal Nerd Society is laughing with us, yes, right? Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure, yes. The Herbal Nerd Society is a paid-for membership group on The Practical Herbalist. Mm -hmm. All the funds go towards supporting this podcast, Real yeah. Herbalism Radio, and in support or in, in trade for supporting us as you do. We are offering to you access to all of the Real Herbalism podcast all the time. Mm -hmm. You also have access to another series we've created specifically for the Herbal Nerd Society, which is called the Let's Talk series. And it is a series of short 15, 20 minute talks with a variety of experts on a variety of topics. Mm -hmm. And then we also offer Herb of the Month articles. Yeah, so it, it kind of an exchange for all of the energy that you guys put into supporting us then we put out a weekly article specifically about the herb that we have chosen for that month. And you can look forward to a variety of them. We've done spearmint, we've done licorice, we've done all kinds of just the full gamut yeah, and look forward done. to even more. We, we try to kind of shake it up. We're learning along with you. It's really fun to do all this research and we hope that you enjoy learning about this advanced herbalism. And don't forget, when you do sign up for your, you get basically you get two months for free, and no one ever mentions this. There's no ads if you're There's an herbal, no ads, herbal nerd true. society member, yep. which is kind of nice because you know it kind of clutters up the page. Yeah. So, the only ad there is is the one that you add in your education. Uh, so, oh herbal nerd society, join now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with that, on with the show. Now here are your hosts, Candace Hunter and Susie Lupe. I'm Candace Hunter. And I'm Sue Sierra Lupe. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Real, Real Herbalism, Herbalism Radio. Radio. Sue? Uh, yes, did you, Candace. Did you play with the Doctrine of Signatures at all? I kind of did, yeah. There awesome. was a couple of things that Jason talked about in that um, conversation that we had about Doctrine of sig sig signatures? signatures that I've been ruminating about. Ooh, yeah. which ones? Well, he had talked about the planets. Yeah. And I, I really it's it's been we we can save this for later in the conversation but it's actually been germane to some of the things that i've been doing at clinic oh how so the let's not save anything for later let's not I'm, stay right I'm a firm believer in eating dessert first okay. <laughs> okay uh so um i work with a lot of trans people sure in my clinic yeah. and it is wonderful to be kind of at the edge there and watch how they're going through moving that fluidity that is gender around yeah and for me as a middle-aged woman just there are so many things that i have taken for granted in my own life 
And working with hormones is actually not all that difficult. I mean, hormones change constantly. Yeah. If you're on a diet, your hormones change. If you drink a cup of coffee, your hormones change. Right. And but, it's the tiniest, like the tiniest little changes have cha right. caused change cascades huge. throughout yeah. the body. Traveling yeah. Traveling is a huge one. Yeah. And we, we kind of... We, I think that um, people in the natural health community, they always have this weird idea that if you do it on purpose, then it's unnatural. Right. <laughs> but that's yeah. like counterindicated it with medicine in general. Just like if you're healing yeah. something, you are purposely, you're putting your intent into these changes. Yes. So to spread that out, the notion of helping someone sustain themselves in the gender that they feel most comfortable in by moving things around so that they're their gender will be not only physically, but emotionally where they feel comfortable. That's a, that, that's kind of a, I don't know. It's, it's majestic for me. Yeah. It's a brand new way of thinking, you know, my eyes just catch on fire when I have right. a new, a new concept. So putting that into this planetary thing was, it was challenging at first because the way that the planets are set up in our kind of older version of it is, there's all these dudes and the one gal and she's she's the patron saint of sex or whatever. You know right. what I mean? Like there's yeah. this Venus. She's the mama or Madonna. Or yeah. is it the mama or the Mag Mary Magdalene or the Madonna? Yeah. She, that's the only two choices for her. Right. And having been raised in a very, very conservative, very, very hardcore, fairly oppressive Christian background, I unfortunately got to see the the side of of viewing women that way right. in an unpleasant way, an oppressive way, a harmful way. So that, that tends to color my oh, own yeah. viewpoint and seeing that in astrology as well, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. One of the things that's a little bit frustrating to me is that when, when in like, you know, in the 1500s and 1600s and, you know, middle in or middle, uh, middle ages and Renaissance ages mm -hmm. when they were, talking about like planter, planets and assigning them gender and plants and assigning them gender. It was also at a point where gender was taking on more, it was like manifesting more firm, concrete, like woman means this. Mm -hmm. Whereas previous to that, I don't know that it was as much a woman means this. It was feminine energy, which was really just phlegmatic energy. And it was okay to have phlegmatic energy in the world, there were many men that were phlegmatic, therefore feminine or effeminate, but were very well respected. And as our world has changed and our society has moved more, we've gotten more and more concrete about it. Mm -hmm. And it's moved in this direction of it's not okay to be effeminate if you're a man, and it's not okay to be masculine and strong if you're a woman. And mm -hmm. I feel like over the last 20 years, we're starting to really come out of that truly dark ages with regard to how men and women think and how mm. we think in general. Right. So can you talk a little bit about phlegmatic? Phlegmatic is one of the, um, the traditional Western herbalism, which is your humors. Yeah. With mm -hmm. the humor system, um, phlegmatic and choleric are the two on the East West. It depends on who draws the compass in the picture, but okay. I'm just going to go with those two as East West. Mm -hmm. um, and so Choleric is what our modern society, I got this from Jim McDonald, which I think he's right. I think he's spot on. He says a choleric is the, the humor that our society, modern American society has really elevated. Mm. It's the heroic, the ability to get a team together and organize them, assign everybody jobs, make sure they're doing it. You know, the CEO that's really, really effective mm -hmm. is, you know, choleric. Mm -hmm. and phlegmatic is the opposite the one who's interested in the emotions wants to factor in how people feel make sure everybody's comfortable it's what oh, we in our society have class have like over the past 50 years 100 years more mm -hmm. or so we've said especially i think since the world wars at least in america we've said men must be choleric mm -hmm. and women are phlegmatic mm -hmm. And perhaps if it is connected to the war, it's because if you go into war, a phlegmatic person isn't going to fare very well, but a choleric person can do the job. Mm -hmm. So we in America assigned more strong and, and inflexible gender roles, and we really took those, we, we just removed the name of the humor and said it's men and women, male and, women and female roles. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was 
a simplification of the way people saw the world like 400 years ago. Right. Well, also, I, I know that uh, the guy Galen and... Uh, Dioscorides? Yeah, Dioscorides, that he was a Greek Greek physician, and then Galen was, he lived during the Roman Empire, but they, they lived during these times when women were really oppressed. You know, it helped their government a lot if they could oppress certain amount of people and well you know women that's that's a that's a good amount right you know all of you here guys let's vote who who should be oppressed oh what a coincidence <laughs> that's what i was thinking so to kind of put that on there and then and then elevate the stature of people that have that particular view and say well this is this is the best way to be and we're going to celebrate that and and it means that we also get to tell all of you guys that aren't of that particular gender, what to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> it makes economic sense, you know, yes. for them, for yeah. sure. So unfortunately it's been used to harm so many other people. And and that's why I I like the idea that like Jason was saying of, of rethinking that. Yeah. Of putting it beyond this uh I, I kind of see it as like a nineteen fifties view of the world, which we don't really think back on the fifties and think, oh, that was that was such a healing time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are those in America currently that would say that that is the greatest age. Uh-huh. And sure. I don't know that I agree with them because I kind of think the age in which I live is the greatest age mm. because I am here. Of course. Yes. And yes. how Good could news. any other age be great without me? It's unthinkable. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but in truth, I mean, wherever you are, that mm. is the greatest. That that's, that's the best. What you got. You because be that's what you've got. Because that's what you've got. Exactly. Sure. Be sure. here now. Yeah. So. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I love that Jason is, he doesn't, from what our conversation and other conversations I've had with him, he doesn't necessarily seem to attach specific hardcore gender roles to the concept of masculine and feminine as much as he's looking at the philosophical idea and understanding how the plant works, active, mm -hmm. not active, or less active, you know, exploding out versus bringing in, Right. you know. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, at least in terms of gender. This conversation really it reminded me a, a lot. I, I thought about this a great deal because we had a person come in who's um, she's living her life at transitioning into being female. Wow. And it's it's she's still on the raw edge of it. So um, she was talking to me about some of the herbs that she could use to support that movement. And I was like, oh, easy peasy, let me just write you through these. But then the thing that, that we started with is the conversation. It's like, well, what is it that that you want in your body that you want to change? She goes, well, I want to be more voluptuous and I want this and I want that. I'm like, what, why? Right. Like, why, why do you, are you sure? Are you really sure that you want that? Because if you have really big boobs, you can get a backache. You know, yeah. There's yeah, I've known people that have had large reduction, like pounds taken out mm -hmm. to reduce the voluptuousness so they and can sleep at night. still have pain. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, but she just know. had this idea that this is this is what women are and this is, yeah. I want to be this kind of woman. Like, well, the kind of woman that you should be is what is comfortable in your body. And also it determines your personality of how you manifest that it is a burden of being a woman, mm -hmm. just as there's burdens in being a man. Right. And how you move that around with strength and with, with grace and in a, in a healing way, you know, right. you're, you're changing a lot and right. we are all tasked with healing in some way. Right. So how are you going to do that? That's that we want to get you to the point where you're feeling very, very safe in your skin right. so that you can turn around and then help others. Yeah. You know, the amount of compassion that, that she is pulling out of this experience is just leaps and bounds. It was, it was astonishing to the, one of the That's other nice. herbalists in the room listening to what she was talking about. It's like, wow, that just, I, man, I got to think about what she said. That, that was amazing to me. I'm so glad that I was able to to hear what she had to say, just be in the room and, and yeah. soak that up. And, and that's great. But that's not that that's not necessarily connected with turning yourself into a movie star looking person, you know? Right. Well, and I mean, you know, Angelina Jolie, no one would ever say she was not voluptuous, volumptu voluptuous. Yeah. Thank you. In the past. And yet today, 
that's not who her what her body looks like yet she still has the radiant personality that she always mm-hmm. had I her mean, strength of will she's strength mm-hmm. she's charismatic she's beautiful mm-hmm. i mean absolutely beautiful and i don't think anybody would say she's not feminine yeah she's incredibly feminine right and strong at the same time and yeah she you know doesn't have <laughs> the voluptu- voluptuousness at all anymore yeah you know So I think we're living through an interesting time with regard to gender. It looks to me like we are, as a whole, as a society, rethinking and exploring new ways of looking at it and separating the hard physicality of gender from the concept of gender or the experience of gender. Mm -hmm. And that's very freeing. Yeah. I mean, it's confusing, but it's very freeing too. Right. And although this is an age of transition, so there's a lot of emotion around it on all sides. Yeah. I imagine that in 50 years or so, a lot of that emotion will have cleared and there will be some new constructs that people will be able to work with Mm -hmm. that will be opening the gates to some amazing new explorations. Yeah. Well, taking that doctrine of signatures is a basic part of it, of looking at something physical and having it mean something else for the, the human body. That's, that's something that I kind of struggle with too, is I'm, I'm a, a slight person. You right. know, I'm tall. Right. But I'm they call willowy <laughs> or lanky. Yeah. And always had that notion, maybe that's why I pay attention to it with particularly with our trans patients about mm-hmm. this 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 is who I am as as a woman. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and that's that's also okay. Well yeah, of course. <laughs> so this this idea of sitting there talking to, you know, I talk about this with some of our, our teenagers too, where they're looking at their bodies and saying, I kind of thought my body would look more like what I see in the movies. Like, well, the people in the movies <laughs> don't look that way. Right. Yeah. When you actually get up next to them, like in reality, they look really different. Yeah. Like Sylvester Stallone is only like five foot six. So he's shorter than me. Right. He may have perfect proportions. And if you angle the camera right and make sure everybody around him is shorter than him, he right. looks huge. But the reality is he's really not that big. Right. James Bond, Sean Connery, same thing. Oh, is he shorter Yeah, he's short as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the male role models we have is at least from bygone eras, they were a lot of, there were a lot of shorter men who Uh just have perfect proportions. Uh So they're shorter, but they're built perfectly, like all proportionate and all um, symmetrical. Mm-hmm. So they look great on camera and the ca- the directors do things like have him stand up or have the camera angle slightly up to oh, make him man. larger to and achieve you, that. Yes, oh, exactly. When you start watching movies with exactly that critical awesome. eye asking that question, you mm-hmm. know, you really start to see it. It's there's fewer actors. There's more actors that are taller now than there were, I think, when I was a kid. Hmm. I mean, there's a few. And I, of course, I'm really bad at remembering names. So. And you can do yeah. so much on movies now. You yeah. know, the set isn't the set. It's yeah, like I know. It's a, like a big thing. blue screen behind them. Yeah, and, and yeah. they have dots on their face and like that's yes. all. Yeah, they can totally like redo have all the set around them. Like yeah. just reprogram it to be shorter or taller to allow the right. actor or actress to look whatever height they want. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. But, it, so it, but it comes back to that notion of looking at your physical body and having that what does that mean? And redefining what that means. The, right. the things that about di- doctrine of signatures that annoys me is things like, well, look at lung ward. It looks just like lungs. No, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look like lungs. Yeah. Yeah. Lung ward's not one that I have to say I've used a lot, nor am I really familiar with how it would be used. Uh-huh. Um, for me, the doctrine of signatures is something that goes a little bit deeper than the surface. Mm. Um, so you look at it, but it's also, there's a, a quality that you'll notice in certain ones, you know, in certain plants. It, it's, and mm-hmm. I am, I mean, I, I don't use it a lot. I'm learning. And mm-hmm. that was actually for me, I picked up, I actually, I picked this book up over a year ago for my birthday. Oh, happy birthday to <laughs> yes, you last year. Yes. Oh, this is the book that you, it's the, yeah, it's called the language, the language of plants. Her. I'm letting you know what happens yeah. behind the curtain. The Language of Plants by Julia Graves. Mm-hmm. And she does a wonderful job. I'm still like chapter four. I'm at the very beginning of it. But she does a wonderful job about talking about taking the doctrine of signatures beyond that remedial 
this plant looks is shaped like a kidney, a kidney bean shaped like a kidney. So it's good for the kidneys <laughs> and taking it into a deeper level of starting to understand like the gestalt of mm-hmm. the plant and matching that to the gestalt of the patient or the condition that you're dealing with. Right. And that's really what the doctrine of signatures is actually about. Okay. And it's recognizing just like in Chinese medicine, you'll recognize patterns, the set of, of, Symptoms together typically might mean you know, yin deficiency, or that set of symptoms might mean excess yang. Hmm. And so those are patterns. And it doesn't really matter who the person is when you get that set of symptoms, then that's where you want to look. Mm-hmm. So it's the same kind of thing with the plants and the way the doctrine of signatures works hmm. is looking at them as individuals that are following patterns. Well, I, I used to use doctrine of signatures as a pneumatic device, as I'm sure many other people have, where they, right. this is how I remember. It just seemed like, I, I felt like I approached plants the wrong way for Sue. Right. Like I was just like, yeah. oh, I have to know all these plants. So right. the only way I'm going to remember it is if I get some little memory tool. Uh, right. Mother water yeah. is good for this. It's good for moms. And ladies' mantle is good. Must be for right. ladies. <laughs> and because it looks like. I don't know, an ovary yeah. or something, you know, yeah. like I had all of these right. dumb little things. And honestly, the way that I've had to learn them is just by picking up plant after plant and working with them. Right. You know, my my hands and my brain have to be attached to each other or otherwise I can't right. figure it out. Right. Well, for me, and what, what she's talking about is that you start to learn typical types of fish signatures. Like, for instance... Our herb of the month for June was lobelia. Mm-hmm. And the seed pods for lobelia and flata are, right. they, you know, they're puffed. puffy little balloons. Puffed. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they're puffy. Mm-hmm. And so that is a signature in all plants. Puffy seed pods is an indication that the plant may be helpful to the lungs. Mm-hmm. In with this particular case, lobelia is helpful to the lungs. So that's, you know, that, right. that follows. There's other ones like Chinese balloon flower is another one that oh, uh-huh. s- does the same type of thing. It's a puffy flower, and it happens to be a really good herb for the lungs. Um, in the case of lobelia, it's really good for, like, asthma that's from inflammation. Yeah. You know what I always use it for, though? This, is, this doesn't help at all, is lobelia is an antispasmodic. Yeah. And that's it my is, number yeah. one that's all I use it for. Right. Like it's in, it's, it, it's in other formulas because we use it in small amounts right. in a lot of different formulas. And it's yeah. certainly in things to help with people that have asthma and stuff right. like that. But yes. And man. it is a good one if you need to diffuse pain, uh-huh. which, you know, the airiness of that pod right. is, you know, the getting moving the air energy in an airy way or diffusing it. Oh, I never would have thought of that. So if you're putting it into a formula and you're thinking, oh, this is an antispasmodic and it's an analgesic formula for whatever kind of pain someone might be having, uh-huh. and you put just a little bit of the lobelia in there, that will help to move the energy away or break up the pain. If the pain they're having is because they don't have enough energy for whatever it is that's functioning, Mm -hmm. lobelia probably would be not the right one. Hmm. In which case, you're probably going to want to choose something that's a little bit more good at concentrating, not diffusing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, a lot of pain, a lot of times, is for needing to be diffused. A lot of times, there's just a blockage of some sort, or there's a tension of some sort. So lobelia can loosen up tensions and loosen up blockages. Wow. So So that's where doctrine of signatures starts to make a lot of sense because you start to match up, you know, when you're looking at two or three different herbs that could all be antispasmodic, which one do I choose? Mm -hmm. Huh? Well, what does the patient look like? What does the condition they're dealing with look like? Mm -hmm. You know, they're having problems with asthma and the asthma problem they seem to be having is more like energy stuck in the lungs, like it's inflamed, their tissues are inflamed, and it's that style of asthma. Lobelia is a really good choice. If the asthma is the kind where it's like tension and torquing and that sort of thing, then there's different ones. I forgot the names. I want to say something. There was a vine that I know. Oh, okay. I don't know a ton about asthma. I don't, uh-huh. I don't work with asthma a lot. Right. But a different the one that ends up re- releasing instead of, like if they feel strangled mm. the strangulation style of asthma which is actually muscle spasms more than it is um 
inflammation. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I mean, again, not an expert in asthma, so maybe lobelia would work best in both cases. But if you have an herb that's really good at removing strangulation and moving energy into the area, Mm -hmm. that might be a better choice. Mm -hmm. So you can look at your patient or your client. You can look at what they're dealing with. Then you can look at the nature of the plant. Right. And the doctrine of signatures is really just a clue. Right. It's like the language. You well, know. we have people that come into our clinic that they're on an inhaler, and mm-hmm. in the the pollen that we have in Eugene right now is oh, god awful. It's you know, heavy. It's thick. Six hundred numbers are six hundred, and like a even a like a bad day is two hundred. Yes. So that gives you an idea of how how horrid it is. And a lot of the pollen that we're experiencing comes from plants that are typically heating, like grass. The whole grass family is a uh-huh. warming or heating plant. So if you want to increase energy (laughs) and you know then you take grass family plants that's Mm -hmm. you know like corn it heats up and warms the system as opposed to cooling things down and the Mm -hmm. pollen in the air is all this plants that are trying to warm things up or Mm they're about warming things up so it just like it makes it really hard Mm -hmm. and our weather's getting warm yes our weather is getting warm so for the people that are coming in with their asthma the they're liking using the uh, mullen based syrups yep and there's a couple of other we have quite a few different cough syrups that we cater to the population that we serve and i think a lot of herbalists end up being kind of bioregional that way yeah you know you use of course the things that like christina sanchez for example the things that she uses are things that grow in her area and they're abundant and the things that we use at occupy medical are things that we get donated Mm-hmm. So there's that. So you got to go with what you got. Right. Yeah. You got to go with what you got. And then you also need to go with what serves your population well. Yeah. So the people that I serve is a very different population than the people that Howie serves right. or the people that you serve, even though we're all in the same bioregion. Exactly. You know, yeah. I could just, I, I can give out lemon balm every single clinic. Right. Because <laughs> it's anxiety, anxiety, and more anxiety. Right. So I could, yeah, I could just yeah. a steady stream of lemon balm syrup and all would be well for me. <laughs> <laughs> Hawthorne right. and whatever. But for other people that are in the same area there, it's more like passion flower or, you know, whatever. I, right. I'm just speculating. Here. Right. Yeah. For me, I, I, this last week I was thinking about the doctrine of signatures. I was thinking about our herb of the month for June, which was lobelia. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about Christina's desert herbs and the blend of tea that I had made to help myself with allergies. Cause I'm, I have a really hard time with heating plant pollens like grass, specifically Uh grass. Yeah. But, and then it's a hot, damp climate. So it's hard for my lungs to release the heat. And so I was thinking about that. And then I was thinking about Lobelia's affinity for asthma. That's the heating type. Mm -hmm. And I decided, what the heck? I'll give that a try. I'm using the Mormon tea that I got from um, Christina. And I'm Mm -hmm. using the Yerba Santa from Christina. I'm using the Mullen that you and I um, harvested, you know, gathered or whatever last fall. And so I put those those three together, and I added just a tiny amount of the creosote that she gave me. Oh yeah, uh, because creosote. I know that it's really good at mucil. It's mus- mildly mucilaginous yeah. and moistening. And although I'm a damp person, and our climate is damp, so I don't need lots of moistening. Mm-hmm. I know it's good to not give someone an excessively drying formula without adding a little bit of moistening herb in to help create balance. Mm. So, you know, I've got those four herbs together and I thought, what happens if I add some lobelia to this? Mm. And I decided, I looked at what Matthew Wood had to say about lobelia. So he's a doctrine of signatures person Mm -hmm. and he's done a lot of innovative modern things with using the doctrine of signatures to find new or use herbs in a new way that weren't necessarily ones that you could look up from you know, Culpepper or any of those. Right. But his application of the doctrine of signatures makes sense. And on top of that, he's got a lot of case studies to say, yes, this this particular herb does work well for this thing. And the doctrine of signatures also supports that. Hmm. So he's got good experience backing his application of doctrine of signatures to that particular herb or formula. So I looked up what he had to say about Lobelia. And he pretty much said, after reading it, 
And thinking about all of it, I decided a single drop of lobelia tincture would be a good synergizer. Mm. And it might help with moving the energy because what I was finding is the desert herbs were helping, but it wasn't as effective as I wanted. So you put one drop in one ounce bottle? No, I'm I'm making it as a decoction. So I make a decoction with the herbs and then I stick them in my quart jar. So I make a quart of it every couple, two or three days. And then the quart jar stays in the refrigerator. And you're dropping and, one drop of tincture in your quart jar? No. So wow. then I take out four, two to four <laughs> ounces, depending on how bad allergies are. And wow. I've noticed that when symptoms are present and it's after four o'clock, mm-hmm. this is a good, still a good decoction to take. Mm-hmm. I get up in the morning and I take two to four ounces because I'm sloppy and I just sort of pour. It's probably mm-hmm. about four ounces that okay. I'm taking. And I put a single drop of lobelia in that and then I drink it. Mm-hmm. And I've been drinking it cold because I keep take it from the fridge and I'm too lazy to heat it up. Mm-hmm. So then later in the day around four o'clock, I look at myself and say, okay, am I noticing any allergies at all? Am I noticing any lung symptoms? Am I noticing any itching in my sinuses, eyes, you know, classic hay fever stuff? Am I noticing the itching behind my knees? Cause I get itching like a rash behind my knees as the first stage for me before the allergies progress all the way into mucus running everywhere. So if I'm noticing even the slightest amount, I take a slightly larger, like four ounces Mm -hmm. of it again with a single drop of lobelia. I tried two drops that did not go well. That made me slightly nauseous. So I'm like, okay, one drop. Whoa. I'm very sensitive. Mm -hmm. So I think that's for me, two drops is just a little too much and that's okay. What I noticed, though, is that after adding the one drop of lobelia and starting to use that, the formula became so much more effective. Hmm. So oftentimes I get to four o'clock and I'm like, eh, I don't know if I really need any. Mm -hmm. And I may not. If I know I'm going to be outside for some reason, I'll do it anyway. But even then, sometimes I'll go outside, won't have allergy symptoms. I might have some mild heart racing, like just starting to feel anxiety in my mm-hmm. chest or my heart rate will speed up a little bit. Mm-hmm. That happens when the formula isn't necessary. So I've noticed that if I take it when I didn't really need to take it, then I have the heart palpitations slightly. But if my body was having the allergy reaction at all and it needed it, then I don't have any of that either. So it's been really an interesting experience to see how lobelia is working and that it's working and such a tiny, tiny amount. Right. Well, Man. those palpitations are probably a reaction to that ephedra. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's exactly what that is. It doesn't scare me. I just know what it is. I recognized it the first time that I took this formula. I drank probably more like six or eight ounces because I didn't know. I was giving it a guess. It's the first time I'm working with Mormon tea. So I'm like, well, I'll try this much. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, first half of the cup, I felt great. And then I came back. I think I was doing something. I came back to it about a half an hour later, drank the second half. And within 10 minutes, started to feel that. And I was like, oh, okay, eight ounces, way more than I need. (laughs) So... (laughs) So I, you know, backed it off and played with it a bit and have have noticed that when the allergy symptoms are present, this decoction works beautifully. Mm -hmm. When they're not present and my body isn't on the edge of the symptoms being present, I can tell that I can feel it, that Mm -hmm. I don't need it. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. And I've been really impressed with how the alobelia changed it. Yeah. Yeah. It is a pretty potent herb. I know a lot of people are are reviving that herb yeah uh, because there's it's a it's got quite the reputation well yeah because it'll make you vomit so dang easily (laughs) (laughs) who wants that that's not good it sucks yeah you know know, sometimes better out than in but yeah, yeah it's it uh it is a herb that i have used myself and i don't i don't i think of myself as kind of a fragile flower but that mm-hmm. one doesn't particularly upset my stomach oh and when i saw you using it for the gallbladder pain you really needed oh, man, it i needed it you yeah really needed it and for antispasmodics i actually prefer black co-wash okay. but yeah. mobilia is easier for me to get a hold of it's easier yeah. to grow here black co-wash is very very difficult to grow you have to have special 
yeah. conditions, whereas Lobelia and Florida is just a garden. It'll grow. Yeah, it can grow yeah. anywhere. And you don't need a lot of it, so it's not like you need to be making gallons or harvesting mm -hmm. gallons. Yeah, definitely. So let's, should we kind of wrap it up a little bit here? Yeah, we yeah. probably should. So Dr. No Signatures, we want to want to thank Jason for helping us out with that. If you uh, if you haven't listened to that podcast, that's podcast 144. So listen to that one. That'll give you a better idea of what we were just gabbing about. Yep. <laughs> Definitely tune in. Yeah. And um, we'll have uh, some of the resources that we mentioned here on this podcast uh, in the show notes. And you can check out the Practical Herbalist. And you can also listen on Spotify. Mm -hmm. And please make sure that you... Um, leave good comments. Leave good comments, please. And then... That makes it easier for people to find us yep. and as well. Now, a word from Thomas Easley about the Journal of Functional Herbalism. The Journal of Functional Herbalism is a free online journal promoting the integration of traditional Western herbalism, clinical nutrition, and functional medicine. It's published by the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine, and you can find the Journal of Functional Herbalism at functionalherbalism.com. Now it's time for Herbal 101, your chance to ask Candace and Sue your burning herbal question. Today's questions, I think we have two today. One is from Kyle. Kyle says he was inspired by the Back to School Herb Lab, and he made an elderberry syrup that was fantastic, which got him to thinking that maybe we should uh, produce a show or a blog post or something. Well, we took what he thought and said, hey, we can do a question about it. So what would make a good herbal daily tonic for nutrition, guys? Candice, Sue? Mm -hmm. Great question. There's so many fun herbs you can work with there, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. And for herbs that you already have to take all the time, like I right. have to take, have to, I'm compelled to take ashwagandha. Yes. So that's yeah. a that's a great thing to put into a tonic. Yes, ashwagandha can be somewhat adaptogenetic or helpful, so that can be a good thing for folks. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the really nutritive herbs. I mean, there's things oh, like, like strawberry and bilberry which are the more obvious strawberry, bilberry, apple, you know, the more obvious fruit types of things, which are very herbal in nature uh -huh. and make syrups taste so good. Yes. Yum. There's stuff like rose hips, which also makes in hibiscus, makes syrups taste so good. Yeah, that would be a little bit sour. So it might be fun to kind yeah. of mix with different things. You get that with the honey in there, though. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, so those are good. And a beautiful color. Yeah, yeah. Most and then, definitely. like you said, the, the, the really nutritive, mineral-rich herbs like the nettle and oat mm -hmm. straw and red clover has yeah. a lot, raspberry leaf. Yeah. Those I, are really wonderful. I think it would be good to have something that stimulates the lymph nodes, mm -hmm. particularly for something that you're taking in the winter. Like I could see something with um, cleavers and pine, something that's in the rose hips, yeah. like a real high vitamin C. Yep crunch yeah so it's mm -hmm. not like about treating something as much as it is helping your body through the season that you're in yep so when you're in the cold dark damp seasons those would be perfect yeah and we do have a, a syrup recipe out there that's in that's in the on the practical herbalist and you, you can find that in the show notes or just go to our website and, and yes. type in in the the search engine say syrup yes <laughs> yeah. you could also make these into cordials that would be a fun oh, yeah. evening thing too you know oh, yeah. if you come home and you just want a little cordial that would be super fun yeah or yeah. for people that like a little tart like i like tart things i like to take the nettle um during allergy season which yes. is while we are recording in a uh vinegar so i'd have the oh, yeah. nettle and the cleavers vinegar yeah and you, if you don't really like the vinegar then that you know, like this person is probably talking about something a little more yummy than vinegar. Right. Yeah. The one I ended up doing was I had some nettle glycerate. You remember mm -hmm. tasting right? that? Yes. It was, oh it was like a hard alcohol nettle glycerate. Yes. I followed the, to the letter as best I could. I think it was to the letter. This like measured out, weighed everything based on the formula of what you should have for your percentage of alcohol and percentage of glycerin and all of that in it. And who it, it tastes pretty alcoholic, I gotta admit. So either <laughs> I made tough. a mistake of which I'm unaware, 
You never make Which, mistakes, though. Didn't we establish that earlier? I'm perfect. So, yes, you know, right. just like my father, he's perfect. I'm perfect. I was uh, born perfect. Oh, that's very yeah. nice. <laughs> so Aww. it's a genetic thing. Okay. You know? She takes herbs for it. <laughs> All right. uh, but yeah, I mean, it's possible. I don't usually make mistakes knowingly. I have uh-huh. often like mismeasured, like measured. And then, you know, I'm like measuring into the pot, the oil that I need for the salve. And then I accidentally put in extra. Oh, I And see there's other stuff mean. in the pot you're already. Like, you can't I take like, it out. Well, nobody makes mistakes knowingly, but you're talking yeah. about the wiggle room thing. Yeah. Like dash of this. And- yeah. Or if I'm like supposed to measure out five grams. Uh-huh. And instead of measuring it individually and separately, I have decided to just measure it directly into the mixing bowl with the other stuff. Oh, okay. And then I measure 10 grams because it plops. Uh-huh. I've I done see. that. Okay. Yeah, I see. Okay. That happens. All right. So, so in, for a tonic, like yeah. this guy is talking about, he wants yeah. a tonic syrup? Is that what he yeah. was saying? He was talking tonic about syrup. tonic or something. I think he was thinking about something that would just be fun just a fun yeah. yummer yeah so everyday. like i did the i did the nettle leaf glycerate yep. that was really alcoholic so i decided to use that for the alcohol part of preserving my syrup uh-huh and then i added some oat straw raspberry leaf i think i put some borage in there oh um, god woman I just, I used nutritive herbs. I mean, I was just looking for nutrition and mm. lots of minerals because allergy season takes a lot of minerals out yes, of your system. It does. So that's what I was looking to put in there. So I made a decoction or actually, I think I did. Yeah, I think I decocted. It was like one of those, it's sort of a decoction, sort of like I put the herbs in the water on, in the pot on the stove, mm-hmm. came up to a boil. I lowered it to like a simmer mm-hmm. for like 10 minutes and then just left it covered mm. for, till it cooled down, strained it. So, you know, not a really hard, like not the kind of decoction you do when you're doing roots and bark. Okay. You know, because these were all plant materials. Right, right. So, yeah. you know, strained mm. it out. And then I put in nettle leaf glycerate to be like 25% of the final blend. Is that the thing that you gave yeah, me? Yeah, that's okay, what I yeah. gave you. That yeah. was palatable. Yeah, it was yeah. tasty. The sweetness yeah. of the glycerin in there is nice and it's, you know, glycerin is lubricating and, mm-hmm. and softening. Yes, so. it is. The, another thing you can do is make a nice little glycerite that you like and add it to things like teas or coffees. Yes. Like that's an easy piece. Yes. You we do that to... with our coffee syrups. I make right. elderberry syrup every year for the guys. And sometimes I add rose hips in there for the guys to add to their coffee. I've done that with cardamom also. Cardamom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It makes a really nice coffee syrup. It's really tasty. I added ginger syrup to my coffee That'd today. Be good. Yeah. Nice. That was a good zest. So I think that gives you a bunch of ideas, Kyle. Yes, And indeed. we expect, now that we've given you the ideas, you must write back and tell us what happened. What did you choose and why? Thank you for your question, Kyle. All right, so this is a short one, so we're going to do two today, extra special bonus. And this question comes from Mackenzie. Mackenzie asks, can you become an herbalist as a real job? (laughs) I love that question. (laughs) Yes, yes, of course. Define real job. (laughs) It's kind of like saying, can you become an artist or a musician? Yes, you most certainly can. Sure, yep. Yes, (laughs) <laughs> I, I am a professional herbalist. Sue is a professional herbalist. Uh-huh. We do make our living doing herbs and herbalism. Yep, as real as we can make it. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. I think it's definitely a lot easier now. And we, we did cover this in a show yes. a while ago. Um, yeah. I believe Howie Brown soon sat down and talked with us about a whole mm-hmm. bunch of different things that you can do as an herbalist. So the thing that I know is that... Uh, you can you can go into the into herb companies. Mm-hmm. There's there's lots of room for that, and the that you can certainly offer your own herbal consulting business. And it depending on where you are, it can be tricky or it can be wonderful. Yeah. Um. I I know one of the things that um, people have been doing is when they're getting out of herb schools, uh, they're using their resources at that time to connect with some other students and put together projects in that way. I don't recommend once you get out of herbs, herb school to start another herb school. Yeah. It would be better for you to practice for quite a while so that you take your theory 
into yeah. experience before you start teaching others. Exactly. That's wise. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you're, I mean, people will say, well, you just graduated from this school. Why don't I just go to the school you went to? Right. So yeah. why would I? <laughs> right. <laughs> like right. that person actually has, you know, yeah. their own theory developed. Right. They've, yes. They, yeah. And they put it into practice. And when, you know, every herbalist has their own flavor. That is know? true. That is so, true. Yeah. A, you can, important. I mean, you can get a job for an herb company like Mountain Rose Herbs or Urban Moonshine. Mm-hmm, it's two, sure. you know, East Coast, West Coast, two different companies. Yep. And the people working there, many of them are herbalists. Mm-hmm. Some of them might be herbalists who are taking care of the books because they do bookkeeping right. because they're good at that. But that doesn't mean they're not herbalists. Right, right. But then there's also the ones who are actually doing formulation or working with the wild crafters or sourcing or... Mm-hmm packaging creating the herbs or herbalism herbs farming stuff farming the herbs farming is another big one yeah. that's a really big one yeah um midwives doulas mm-hmm. uh people that work with um other alternative they call it alternative medicine although it's just medicine yeah. uh, <laughs> right providing good resource uh organic herbs for them that's yes. really important and you can be an uh herbalist and a nurse and you can be an herbalist and a, a midwife and you know all of these exactly you know, at the same time wendy right wendy hansel uh-huh. yeah, so yeah. i always forget her last name i can see it and somehow i never <laughs> am able to say it because i get myself tripped up she's delightful and mm-hmm. she's an rn registered right. nurse who is also an herbalist yeah she'll be an np actually fairly soon nice yeah nice. And she's a great her her blog is called uh, herb nurse Nice. <laughs> That's nice. how I discovered her in the first place. Yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, the yeah. herbalist that I originally learned from that I started with was um, Don Tomerdal Tom, Aska. At mm. the time, she was Tom, Don Gates, which was so much easier for me <laughs> to say. But either way, she is a, a um, nurse RN. She has a master's and she's running the, she's, she's, I don't know her exact job title. So, Mm -hmm. you know, make sure I say this right. She's working at a cardiac unit in a hospital down in Florida. Oh, okay. And I believe if I remember right, she's like really high up, like she's management Mm -hmm. level at this point. Mm -hmm. And she's also an herbalist and she has a school and she's very active as an herbalist. And she does both because she loves both. Yeah. So, you know, you can teach. You can become a part of a company. You can go on your own. There are folks like Christina Sanchez who of Every Leaf Speaks, who's, you know, young in her herbal career and she's creating formulas for folks sure she's yeah, creating she's, herbals and doesn't she integrate it in her uh beauty school she does or, uh, so beauty beauty school, care. she has a salon yeah she does yeah. consults with her clients and she works with folks to help them find more natural ways to achieve the beauty results they desire mm-hmm. so there's a lot of different potential ways that you can become an herbalist mm-hmm. there are therapists there's um a friend of mine rebecca ingles out on the east coast who was and i believe still is a practicing therapist but she's also an herbalist huh. and she's really really good at both and she integrates them and they're very integrated yeah, yeah. i know if uh, there's a new thing the death doulas and uh, they're oh yeah I yeah they people, help people grace their way into death rather yeah. than going death no that's just right it's never gonna happen right. so they're not only helping the person who's passing but also okay. helping the family that's big helping yeah. people through that transition is big and you, know, you can imagine how the the herbs would integrate very well with that just oh, yeah. helping people stay calm and centered and present and just as we have talked about i believe it was with uh, ashley let let ellen boss her her um, podcast, she was talking about how important it is to just be centered and, and listen to the person yes. and not immediately tie it into what, you know, it's in your life, but just hear where they are. You know, there's an herb for that, too, that will yeah. help you with that, because that can be really tough when it's your family member or somebody oh, yeah. you've known for a long time. Oh, yeah. When they're talking about their pain, you just like it goes right to your gut. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. having something that helps you just kind of stay centered and let them be present in their spot and also be present for them. Right. That's, that's a, that's a rough one. Yeah. And I mean, that's just all talking about if you're interested in farming or herbs for people, veterinary medicine has a whole huge branch of folks Mm -hmm. that range all the way from, you know, people who are really interested in like the flower essence practitioners Mm -hmm. and homeopathic level, you know, very light, I don't want to say lightweight herbalism because it's really powerful, but it's using very 
light L- doses of dose the plants yeah. Yeah. to mm-hmm. people who are working with, you know, cancer care for dogs mm-hmm. and, you know, more horses oh my goodness. and yeah. horses. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's a wide range of what herbalists can do. Yeah. Uh, landscaping. Oh, that's you a know, big one. Integrating yeah. your, your herbs into your landscape. That's huge. Mm-hmm. And, and people, people can, you know, talk about flower essences when yeah. they're growing right outside your yard. That's oh yeah, that's the best flower essence that ever. Is good medicine. Yeah. So, so yes, yes. The answer uh, is yes, you can. Yes, Mackenzie, you can definitely do it and be an herbalist as a real job. Yes, Virginia, there is an herbalist. Mm-hmm. Well, until next time, everyone. Put, put an, an herb, herb on, on it. it. Hey guys, just to let you know that the Practical Herbalist and Real Herbalism Radio is going to go on a hiatus. It's our annual hiatus for the summer. It's a time where we get to get out and garden and do all the herbally stuff that we love to do. So you will hear probably four or more, depending on how long we want to take a break for, uh, podcasts from our classic collection. Uh, we might do Herbs for Anxiety. We might do an interview with uh, Mary, um, Rosemary Gladstar. It could be just about anything. So watch for those on your regular Tuesday release dates. And uh, until next time, bye. <laughs> the statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided on this podcast or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials, questions, or case studies are based on individual results and do not constitute a guarantee that you will achieve the same results.